getting carried uh, into the meeting. Right, the first um, submitter is Mike Woods. You would note that he's got a mask exemption. We all need to have our masks on once they come in the room. You can figure that out. <laughs> like I'm stuck. If you were one of my children, you'd just do that. <laughs> Mr. Woods, welcome. Oh. You, you've got. Um, just hold, just hold, can you just hold on a minute? Yes. I, I, I won't speak to people wearing masks. So well, you've you got you a choice. You can speak now or you can exercise your individual rights and leave. Yeah, I, won't, I wouldn't speak on Zoom because I can't see you properly. And I, I checked with it before coming here, and they said, no, you probably won't be wearing masks. So I will not speak to people who are masked up. We are required to mask up when members of the public are here. Well, I'm a member of the public. I, I, I don't mind. But that's your I problem. At the, you at the moment, off. that's the protocol we have right now. It's your choice whether you want to submit now or you don't. But be, but know that your submission has already been, your written one has already been accepted. Well, I, I just get over it very, very quickly then. Please do. You read my submission, where I, where I support Christine Paps. She's asking for enhanced community boards and to get rid of the ward councillors. Well, since the last few weeks. I've been thinking about this quite deeply and I've made a decision to reverse what I said about the, about the ward councillors. I think it's very, very important to have very strong local independent community, um, local, local bodies. So I would like to keep the ward councillors, that's the modification to my written submission. I want to keep the ward councillors. And the reason for this, we're in a time of medical tyranny at the moment. And we need more people like Sandra Gowdy, Thames Car Caramandel Mayor, who is willing to speak out on her personal preferences. Now, she's been torn to shreds by the media, piece by piece, for daring to speak her mind. And I believe she's a very brave woman. And I'm hoping that at least one person in this community here, this council, one person would give her some support. Because otherwise, this country is slipping faster and faster into totalitarianism. Not only here, but the whole world. We have to take a stand before it's too late. That's all I want to say. I'm going home now. Thank you very much. I guess there'll be no questions. Well, no. Oh, well, why not? Yeah, Councillor McCann. What, um, what prompted you, sir, to uh, change your mind about ward councillors? Because that's obviously that's quite a significant thing, yes, given, given that the arguments being made were about representation. So very interested to know what, what prompted you to change your mind. What's changed my mind is the reaction to Sandra Gowdy. The reaction to her speaking out is diabolical. And I thought what we need is strong local bodies, strong councillors who are willing to speak out. And if we got rid of you, okay, this is going in the direction of assisting the people who want totalitarianism. They, they actually don't want local bodies. They want all decisions to come from the top. And every day, every day, we get another decision from the top without any public input. So we don't know what's coming tomorrow. They could just dream up some idea tomorrow night. This is not democracy. So that's why I've changed my mind. 
I'm relying on you guys to to step up, step up and um, stop this slide. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. And one of the things that I would note is that we try and make our, our minds up on evidence. So I, I wouldn't be backing that. Yes, yeah, so we're not going to debate. Right, very good. Any other questions? Um, no, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Right, the next speaker, submitter is Cathy Spires from the Paraparamoramity Community Board. You, you have five you have five minutes. Um, you know the routine. Bell will go, sum up, and then question time. No, but if the next submitter was to walk in during Cathy's submission, we would need to put them back on. <coughs> Marina. The Parapari Muramani Community Board supports retaining Otaki, Waikanae, Pakakariki, Parapara Umu community boards with the addition of a Raumati community board. They are all communities of interest and deserve fair representation. Community boards are grassroots democracy which are needed more than ever now with all the government reforms. Community boards always have and always will continue to represent our communities and advocate on their behalf to whoever and wherever that takes us. The population of Parapara Umu as at June 2020 was 29,700, Raumati and Raumati South 9,150, giving a total population of Parapara Umi Raumati Community Board area of 38,850 people. I contend the Parapara Umi Raumati Community Board members have done extremely well in listening and advocating on behalf of our communities. You can see some of our activities and successes from their, yeah. from their attachments. Since lodging the board submissions, we have received further requests from residents around congestion of parking and vehicles in Warramu Street. It hinders the Wellington Free Ambulance. Um, that is still going on. Follow-ups from Martin Kalkar Memorial, planting native trees at the Cuffley Bears Rugby League Club, questions around footpaths, State Highway 1 revocations, Poppin Centre ladies had some issues, Coastal Hazards Meeting, Canada, Canada Geese, and so the list goes on. I contend there are no barriers between residents and community board members. Sometimes it feels like there are barriers between community board and, and staff. Community board members do not sit around and wait for residents to come to us. Board members have been across the whole board area with pop-ups during the long-term plan, beach bylaws. We always have and always will listen to a diverse range of voices in our communities. Setting up meetings and setting up meetings with staff. After a request from a resident in Nika Valley, we set up a meeting. 30 residents um, came from Nika Valley. Many residents said, go away. We are happy over here um, and we like it, and so we basically leave us alone. However, we, um, they did set up a, 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 a residence group and have had one request from them around the um, issues around burnouts over there. This has been forwarded, this was forwarded and dealt with by Sean's wonderful team in council, as has um, issues around Kaitawa and Mangatukatuki residents. More support from staff would be valued. During the long-term process, LTP process, I requested if our board is able to have some promotional material included in the centre file that council has in the local newspapers. I was told this could not happen. In the end, an ad went in the public notices, which costs more money. Our community board has just started working with Mr. Carl Weber from Parapara Umi Beach, and Carl is um, coming to our meetings and giving us updates on what's happening around Parapara Umi. Community boards are purpose-led. Our purpose is our anchor. Council needs to respect where community boards have come from, with the aspirations and courage to continue on the journey, walking alongside our residents, council, councillors, for our communities and young people who will one day take over. The work of community boards is important to us and our communities. There will always be challenges. We need to work collaboratively to be resilient, as that is where our strength is. We all need to be brave and make courageous decisions. Local governments were set up to look after the needs of local communities, and as it was felt that residents knew what their needs are much better than central government. Hence, we need to hold on steadfast to our local grassroots democracy this can only be by committing, keeping community boards who need to be valued for the tireless work all hours of the day and night. 
Oh, thanks. Councillor Coote. Morning, Kathy. Good to see you here. Just looking at your submission, there is a couple of points that I want to raise um, in relation to other submissions we've received. Um, one is there's been a number of submissions that have supported small wards and ward councillors. Um, so I was interested in whether you, um, well, your thoughts on that, even though it's not included in your submission. Um, your, um, also in your submission, you said to consider fewer district-wide councillors. And by fewer, I wondered whether you had a number in mind that the board felt was appropriate. Thank, thank you, Councillor Coates. Um, with the smaller wards, I think um, Raumeti, um needs to have a, a community board. But, um, and Waikana and Paraparaumu are different communities of interest, and I don't think that those wards should come together, or the community board feels that. But um, not all Taki, Waikana, Paraparaumu, and maybe Raumati, Pakakariki, but then you get to the numbers game, don't you? Um, what was your second question, Lee? Uh, it was around the comment in your submission around fewer district-wide councillors. Oh, right, yes. Well, I thought, if, I mean, your councillors have the power to make the decision at the end of the day, so I thought if you were finished up with four wards, then it would make sense to have four district-wide councillors. Thanks, Cathy. <coughs> Councillor Hanford. Kia ora, Cathy. Um, you mentioned that you see there to be no barriers between the community and the community board and acknowledging too that you've done a great job in that and getting out and about and so has so have the other members of the board. But I just wonder whether you feel that that extends to all members of the community and all sectors of the community. Is there anything that you think could better support the board or support the current arrangements to reach people who might be slightly harder to reach? Well, um, thank you, Councillor Hanford. That's why the community board we went over to Nika, uh, over to Nika Valley. There was just one gentleman, so we thought, you know, they're isolated over there, and maybe there's, you know, council was here, and just to let them know that council's here if there are any needs. But the message we got that we're rural, we're happy, um, and leave us alone. But I don't. If we had more promotion, like Kathy Grey Power wanting us to for a long time to put some advertisements and things in their magazines but we haven't had the funds. And now that we've got the funds, we're hoping that we can get out and promote more so we can get more to more of those um, people. But some people just, um, when we're out on the long-term plan, <coughs> um, met lots of people. And some were saying, very happy with council. Others walked past and said, not interested. Um, and others said, don't listen. But a majority of them said they were happy with council. So you, you just get people who like to be involved and others who just, too busy getting on with their lives and bringing up children and families and working. So, and I think you know sometimes when you're young, local government doesn't really interest you. <laughs> when your family leave home, you just think, oh, what can I do? So, and you've got a passion for it. And I mean, I was born in Otaki. I went to boarding school in Otaki. Lived in Tikoro, Otaki. I made it part all my life. So, I mean, I'm passionate about it, and I'm sure young people growing up here are passionate about the coast as well. To, to you know, carry on where we. Go out the other end. <laughs> Councillor Elliot. Well, look, thank you very much, Kathy, I mean, your board members. I just had a question about your comment that you're liaising now, working now with Carl Weber. And can I just ask, um, just so that we we know going forward, um, in what capacity is Carl speaking on the growth? Is he representative of an iwi, and if so, which iwi, or is he speaking for himself, or representing other groups? Um, well, Carl just comes as himself, but we just had a meeting really recently with the Pada Pada Umu RSA, who've been, they've been trying since 2017 to get a memorial on McLean Park with no traction. So we invited Carl along, and um, he was very helpful and got chatting, but this is why we would be good to have more powers, so we can um, you know, appoint someone from, from Manawa Whanua or Iwi to, to our community board, because we need that input. Okay, so at the moment he's representing himself. Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. But it is good to get, you know, the knowledge that he has around, you know, McLean Park and the history. Councillor Holiday. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, and um, thank you very much for coming along, Cathy, and I think as I've noted uh, at this table, you know, thank you for all the work you've been doing on the community board. Much appreciated. Look, I just wanted to um, tease out the uh, com comment you made with regards to walking alongside our residents. Um, in the discussions we've had, we've had... Um, community boards talking about uh, having more um, voting rights, uh, more um, uh, decision-making power at the table. Um, I guess that versus uh, working in the community as such and bringing the community voice in, what are your views on 
uh, the differentiation between those two? Well, I think it would be really good if community board chairs had um, voting rights, maybe not around the council table at a council meeting, but mainly at strategy and operations and audit and risk and those um, smaller committees, but maybe not at a council, full council meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your view, um, uh, uh, community boards should be working more in the community as such, or um, uh, is, that, should we, uh, is the focus supposed to be more sort of community-faced than, should we say, um, uh, council-faced as such? Well, community boards are exactly that, community boards, and we do work in the, in the community, but, I mean, there's nothing to stop anyone in the community ringing up a councillor and having a mm. chat as well. Um, I don't see any barriers there. People have always done that. If they're not on the internet, there's always the phone. Mm. I've, I've used the term a translation point. You know, you think um, community boards can be a good translation point mm. between the community mm. and council. Oh, we certainly, I mean, we'd certainly advocate on behalf of our communities and we don't give up until we get the outcome we, de we desire, the out that the community wants. So mm. it stays there until we get an outcome. Thank you very much. Council Goods. Kathy, I've just picked up on a comment you said earlier, it was too actually one about having more powers and I've asked a number of the other community boards around this because it's kind of a blanket statement and there's no substance mm -hmm. often backed up behind that around and some of them you know, stumble when you ask well what are those more powers. Um, the second part you said was around having a vote around the table. Now a lot of people have quoted the piece from Mike Reid, who I have a lot of respect for and think it's a very good piece around the importance of community boards. However, Mike Reid also said um, and I'll just a very short sentence and be careful not to cherry pick, but it is directly related to the comment you made about voting, is that community boards are not little councils and if they to have a future, they need to see themselves as part of the community and not its government, which is essentially mm. the table. So how does that reconcile with your thoughts around community boards then becoming a part of the decision-making process and having votes? Um, and interested in the comment around more powers and what that looks like. Um, oh, with, with more powers, it would be really good if we could um, appoint our own um, EWI representative on our community board. I think that is really, really important. But also, a lot of little issues come to our community boards. Like there was, um, and I just mentioned one, Martin Kalkar Memorial was removed from the skate park at Paraparumi Beach. He was a 21-year-old who died from cancer a few years ago, and he was um, befriended many young people down at the skate park. Now the community board gave granted $500 for that to be replaced and it still hasn't been replaced because of the process. It would be good if a community board would say, well, look, this has been there before, it was, it's been removed. We should be able to say, well, you know, it's in our patch. Um, it, it's OK to, to, to um, replace it. And, oh, but, and power, oh, voting around the council table. Did, does that answer your question? Or? Uh, Mm, yeah, it's. I mean, it, it's just an. It's just an idea. So yeah, I mean, it's. Councillor McCann. Uh, Kia ora, and I just want to acknowledge. I think the whole table recognises the tremendous work that you do, and this is a difficult discussion. I was just following up um, similar questions around James, and I'll just follow up the last statement. Um, when, when community boards are asking for more powers, one of the things that you suggested was um, chairs being able to um, participate in a vote. Can you explain to us uh, the difficulties that there are in electing chairs and whether further exacerbating the rights of a chair versus the other community board members would create even more angst than we already know exists in the community and community boards? Oh, so you're talking about community boards. If the community board members themselves had angst against the chair making, taking yeah, a vote. So we, we are aware that often, um, that because you're elected as community board mm. members, mm. and then amongst yourselves you have to elect a chair, mm. would um, creating uh, more differences between what the chair is entitled to and the rest of the board create even more issues? Well, I, I don't... I don't see that because our community board, we always discuss everything before I open my mouth. Well, that's usually the process I try to, to stand by. Sometimes I slip. But, um, but I would never do anything if we didn't have the full support of community board members. 
And the second question is just around the um, that governance issue. You talked about wanting to, to, and gave us a good example in the skate park. Do you not think that though, regardless of whether that would be a decision by community board or councillors, it's actually an operational issue? It is, but all we're trying to do is replace something that was there previously and was taken away. Um, but I, I just want to delve into this, because while you're asking for more powers, mm -hmm. you would actually be uh, asking for something that councillors don't have, because it would be an operational issue that you're actually... Okay, see, yeah, I, yeah well, see, I don't see an issue or a problem there. But it's also around the $20,000 that all community boards have been granted. Now, it would be good to have some you know, control over that, but we, that's four, four, five, four and a half months now into the next 12 months, and we're still waiting for council to set down the criteria before we can even know how we can spend it with no input from the community board. Okay, thank you. Councillor Provanov. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair, thank you, Kathy, for coming along to speak today and um, on behalf of the Community Board and your submission. And I certainly acknowledge all the work that you as your ch Chair do and your Community Board. So I have two lines of questioning. Um, as, as being a previous member of a Community Board, um, yeah, I'm aware of the processes that occur in terms of having uh, getting papers mm -hmm. that come to Community Boards. And sometimes um, it, is act, it, it, is, it takes time to get these papers the to the board so then you can make some, some decisions. Can you make um, some comments about whether the, the, that process is actually helpful or there could be some ways that could be changed? Um, I think the process, the process for getting papers to the board is really, really good. I mean, Sean's team and infrastructure is really excellent. There's a really good relationship there. It's just when people from the community come to the community board with their concerns and trying sometimes to get an answer for them to, so we can get back to them. And it's just a couple of issues are just taking a long, long time to get um, even a five minute conversation. But with the papers and that, there's, there's not a problem. And there's good communication, as I said, with the infrastructure team and Tani's team, and that is really, really good. Okay, that's great to hear. So my second question um, relates to community boards. So obviously, um, the proposal at present is to uh, remove community boards and I'd just like to hear, um, you know, you've spent quite a lot of talk time today talking about um, your involvement in the community and the community, um, community's reliance, I suppose, how they come to the community board. Um, can, you, um, can you see how um, the community would be fulfilled in terms of their, um, their needs, their feedback, their support if there were no community boards? Or well, I mean, we would, we would they go? Community boards spend many, many hours with, um, with residents talking through the issues and helping to support them. With councillors, your job is governance, you know, looking after our, the ratepayers' money. I mean, we're servants of our communities, really. And all the paper, and I mean, I get all the council papers as chair, plus all my community board work. It's, it's just about a full-time job. I mean, there's no day goes by where I've got nothing to do with, but I'm, I'm always doing something with council. So I just think it's a time thing, but I think we're at grassroots level and this, the governance is at a higher level, and I think you need that, that feed, feeding through from the grassroots, otherwise you just lose contact with what's happening down at the grassroots level, and it's about democracy. We don't want to lose that. Thank you. Councillor Elliot, you, oh, hold on. Councillor Holborough, please. Yeah, th thank you so much, Cathy. Uh, th this um, submission really, really highlights the huge amount that the board's been doing. I just wanted, um, I know at the Pakakadika Community Board meetings, there's a chair's update and then a member's update. How much of this is work that, that you've been doing as chair and how much of it is work that the other community board members have been doing? Um, with the monthly updates, it's mainly myself, but we have delegated. Um, Guy Burns is really, really good because he lives in Raumati South, so he brings issues from the Raumati South Residents Association. Johnny works around Raumati Beach and Grace works around Paraparumi Beach. But I guess a lot of the, the work is myself, but always, um, it doesn't matter whether there's one of us doing it or whatever, we're all working on behalf of the community board. So you, you've mentioned three, three members, but thank you very much. All right. 
Councillor Elliott. Oh, look, thank you, um, Your Worship. I just want to take the opportunity to address an elephant in the room that's been, it's been a, around this discussion. So we had a speaker, one of our early speakers yesterday, Cathy, refer to community boards' roles as being the collective responsible voice. Champion community council-led community projects, informing the public, the community, and, 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 and gaining legitimacy for the council role and, and, and your role. Where in fact, we have a lot of examples of the community voice being a divisive individual voice, misrepresenting projects, not actually informing, rather than informing, criticising the council, not championing the projects in the community, uh, putting out vexatious media, and um, using methods to media to create division. Now, I just want to address you because you're a really experienced elected member and just ask for your comment on how this can be addressed going forward because I really want community boards to be a positive force in the community. Well, I guess the way our community board, um, I mean, when we elected the chair, there was, you know, a couple of us who wanted to be chair, but we're big adults and we got over that and we work as a team together now and we're all working together. And there was one comment, the vision. Um, it's, but I suppose at the end of the day, we're all individuals and we all have a right to say how we feel, but that doesn't... Can you be more specific? So you're talking about our Raumati Community Board and members of our so board putting out these releases? Can I just intervene here and say, look, we don't want to get into that. No, um, that's the question what was, was asked. Yeah. You gave an answer. Yeah. We need to move along. Do you have another question? No, I don't, but, but thank you, Kathy. Thank, thank you, Councillor Elliott. Right. Um, thank you for that. I think you've been hammered with the most number of questions. <laughs> well done. That's right. I'm, well I'm old now. I can take it. <laughs> Is that what happens? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Big adults now. <laughs> Uh, we are now entering the realm of Cameron Butler. Um, he's speaking as an individual and then speaking as uh, a member of Otaki Promotions Group and then Otaki Kenu Club. Cameron Butler rules. Um, now, am I going to blow the system by slightly rearranging that order and doing Canoe Club yeah, you can OPG do that. than me? That's fine. Awesome. Right. Whoop. these people that has to fiddle and talk at the same time. Well, tēnā koto koto, everyone. Um, thank you for allowing me the ability to come here and speak. Um, just a quick little bit of background. I've been an Otaki and Te Horu resident for the last five years. Previous to that, I will admit to living in Auckland. <laughs> However, I'm at this, at this moment very, very happy to be outside of Auckland. Um, and I was a frequent visitor to Otaki for my sport of canoe polo. Um, I also did live in Palmerston North for five years, so I can tell you what, I much prefer living down here even compared to Palmerston North, which is a, a grey, horrible city in winter. <laughs> so I'm speaking to you, three... You realise this is public, eye. Yep, 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 okay. yep, I know. I, I stand by what I say. <laughs> um, so I am speaking to three submissions here, so I'm going to go into the Otaki Canoe Club one first. So I'm a member of the Otaki Canoe Club Committee. Um, I am a senior member, which means, yes, I am one of the older ones. And the club committee has put forward the fact that they would prefer the community board to stay. They would um, like the proposal to be rejected. Now, how does the community board affect us, or how do we interact with the community board? One of the big things that we do as a canoe club is we make a big utilisation of the Haruatai pool. Now, if some of you knew the pool before it was refurbished, it was dark, noisy, and very old looking. Now, the refurbishment of that was um, Penny Gaylor pushed that through, and one of the comments that Penny made was that was that it was fantastic to actually have the chair of the community board by her side helping with that proposal, and that was um, Councillor James Coots, and he helped with um, putting that proposal forward. And what we've got now is a beautiful pool that is an asset to Otaki and to the Kapiti region. And I know from my sport, New Zealand Canoe Polo, 
brings training camps and therefore people and money into the area because it is such a, a great facility. Outside of the community board involvement with um, the refurbishment of that pool, we have also been the recipient of a couple of grants from the board. Um, we have a number of our players that play the sport because they love it, but they do also struggle money-wise a bit. And so those grants have enabled some of our teams to head to the Canoe Polo School Nationals, where they performed very admirably. They've allowed some of our players to compete nationally in National League competitions, which gives them opportunities that they may not have had before. Um, so we are grateful for the community board being there. And I know there could be other funding sources and there could be other ways of doing the funding. However, the local board is local to us. The people that we know and people that actually know us, because not everyone actually even knows of the sport of canoe polo. And yet we have um, a gold medal, a world champion gold medal winning coach and multiple players in our club. Um, so we, we punch above our weight as a club. Um, so in terms of the canoe club, that's pretty much it, short and sweet. Right, um, um, can I will handle this one lot at a time. Yep, no problem, thank sure, you. Can I open sure. this for questions? No? Nope. Oh, not too controversial. Then. Right, you can go on to the next one. Then. Okay, right, with my OPG hat on. I thought about bringing a paddle in for the canoe club stuff, but <laughs> I thought that might be a little bit twee. So the Otaki Promotions Group, which I am the chair of, um, we, as you know, organise the Otaki Kite Festival, which is a um, massive undertaking and is supported by the um, Kapiti Coast District Council in that undertaking. We also do the Otaki Community Expo to try and get local clubs and community groups out there in one place so that people can come and see them and see what they do. Unfortunately, our, our event on October 30th has been now postponed till next year due to the COVID issues. We were eternally optimistic that we'd be in level one by now, but given the requirements of the hall and the um, likely people to visit, we decided it was best to postpone that. We also do the light up Otaki, where we do the Christmas lights through the area, um, and we're looking at expanding that this year. Of course, level one would be very useful for that, so if anyone can help with that, that'd be great. So. As an organisation, we deal directly with the council in terms of our um, grant money that we receive to assist with the running of the festival. We also have dealt with the community board in terms of the grants because we have gone to them for the, for the smaller amounts of money to help with things like the community expo and the light up Otaki to um, help make those um, events a, a better and a better thing for Otaki. We've, our interactions with the community board have been good because again they're local people, they know us and they've been relatively stable. Unfortunately we can't say the same thing about the um, person that, main person that we deal with with Kabdi Council. Um, when I asked Kirsty, who's our project manager how many different people she's dealt with over the sort of the last six to seven years she actually said she'd just given up counting um, and that's just an Unfortunate, if it had been one person the whole time, it would have been lovely. But, you know, when you're dealing with four or five different people because people are not staying in the job, it makes harder. Our preference would be just to deal with one entity, and that would be the community board, because they are the local people, and they know us best, we know them, and we like to keep things local. In saying that, the Kite Festival is a fantastic asset for the whole of Kapiti because it brings in people from all over Kapiti to Otaki and also from outside um, Kapiti to the area for a, a fantastic weekend that literally brings Otaki to a standstill. Um, there was apparently not one single ice block left in Otaki after the last kite festival. However, we did have the, the perfect situation of fantastic weather, wind and, uh, and, and a long weekend. Um, outside of that, um, the OPG doesn't particularly um, have any other comments regarding the mayors and councillors and bits and pieces, um, so I'm happy to take any questions on that. If you have so any. this is the group 
You're the, taking Otaki Promotions Group. Correct. Any questions? Councillor Holborough. Kia ora. Thanks for Kia ora. the amazing work you do on the, the, uh, the Kite Festival. It's just outstanding. So event management's quite a spe specific uh, kind of skill, and there's lots of kind of health and safety considerations, mm -hmm. traffic. How would you ensure that you had the expertise on the community board to be able to support with that kind of thing? I'm just a little bit curious how that would work. Um, it wouldn't be up to the community board to put those things in place, councillor. That's, up, that's our responsibility. So, so when you say you'd prefer to just be dealing with the community board, what kind of things so would in, be... So in terms of the, the funding and the like, um, we would be happy just to deal with the community board. So rather than having to go to two separate places for separate lots of funding, it would be far easier if, you know, if we could just go to the community board and talk to them about the event funding. Yeah. Councillor McCann. Thank you very much um, for your comments. And I just want to pick up on two things. Yeah. Um, one is the community board funding versus perhaps major event funding. Mm -hmm. Do you want to, to speak to the differences in that? or? Um, so in terms of the actual value or well, maybe more specifically? Um, so how is that related to the representation review? Fine, it was just brought up regarding funding. But if you want to respond to that. The, the other thing that's more relevant that the Mayor will let me <laughs> is that um, you, you talk about wanting to deal with one person. Yeah. How many changes in the local community board have there been in this triennium? In this triennium there's been only one. And that was for personal reasons. And to be honest, in chatting to them, I, was, I, I, and I backed them on their personal reasons. And oh. those sorts of things will happen. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the change always occurs. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that um, change occurs within our council as well. Yep. One of the things that sometimes drives that change, and I wonder if you could speak to this, because there's been a lot of publicity emanating from your board which has been very critical of council and council staff, whether those type of comments actually play a role as to whether staff actually want to, to work in this environment. I think that would be up to their personal um, take on it, to be honest, in terms of how they react to what the community board says. Thank you. Councillor Pravano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, thank you very much for coming along to speak today. So, um, you know, you've um, provided a lot of um, information about the role of the community community board and, and how important they are. Um, could you, uh, <coughs> sorry, um, think about the scenario if there was no community board there and how you would actually then be able to operate in terms of, you know, all the the various activities you're involved in? Um, for the promotion group? All, all um, three of them, all the, you know, the two yep. groups that you're talking about, so. personally. <laughs> Sorry, I could just see that falling over. <laughs> um, so <laughs> from in terms of the Kite Festival, we would hope that that would carry on and that it will go on no matter what, who we're dealing with. At the end of the day, we've just said who we would prefer to deal with. Yes. If we have to deal <laughs> direct with the council, then you know, that is life and we'll get on with it. The smaller grants, um, without knowing what the actual system would be instead of the community board, it's harder to say. Certainly if we have to travel down to Parapara Umu or if we have um, people like myself that are happy to travel, that will still likely happen. Um, but you do see at the community board meetings there are people there that are walking there. Um, or people that are shy and need their support people there, whether they would come to a, a different body that they don't know or travel down to here. I would, in terms of conjecture, um, there would be a drop-off of people looking for those grants and therefore there's less people getting them. But that's just my personal opinion. Thank you. So um, just following up on the grant side of things, mm -hmm. Um, are you aware of how, if, if the community boards didn't exist, where that money would then come from? Um, I believe there is a funding committee within the council, um, and I assume that would be repurposed to actually give out some of that money. I think that might be one of the options that has been proposed. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Ms. Ms. 
Mr. Badla, can we go on to your um, individual submission? Yeah, sure thing. Thank you, Your Worship. Right, so with, a, with another hat on, um, <laughs> it's, always, it's always hard to probably see the, the, the differences, um, but I'm not about to take my top off, sorry, because I've got nothing underneath. Um, so I'm standing here <laughs> as the newest community board member in Kapiti. Um As indicated, I came on when Stephen Karkik um, resigned for personal reasons from the Otaki Community Board. Um, I was disappointed that he resigned because he um, represented a bit, gave a bit more diversity to the community board. Um, however, I guess that gave me an opportunity to be here. Um, that was certainly, you know, an exciting moment for me. Um, however, my excitement didn't last particularly long. Um, and kudos to James for giving me a call to give me the heads up. That probably wouldn't have been an easy call um, to actually say that the representation review was looking at getting rid of the community boards from the moment that I just got on there. So what in my mind is a community board? It's local people voted onto the board by locals and it's local democracy in action. From looking at the proposal, all I can see is that it takes that local democracy away and ha puts that power into fewer people. That in my mind is just not, not local democracy. I'm impressed at the number and the quality of the submissions that came in. 530 is a lot, um, and I know you guys probably didn't really want to spend your weekend reading them. Um, I did skim through almost the entirety of them, and you know, I, was, I was quite impressed. I mean, I did a very quick internet search, and Tauranga City Council received only 139 submissions and only 18 people wanting to speak. Um, so it shows you there's a, a depth of passion there in, in the Kapiti region about this proposal. Going through those submissions, you would have seen there was some negative comments there, and, and you'll always get positive and negative. But there were people you know, going on, it's, oh, it's already been decided and they'll just do what they want and, and bits and pieces. I mean, those are people's opinions and this is democracy in action by allowing people to say those things. Um, I did, as an aside, find there was one interesting submitter who did actually say, I strongly agree with getting rid of the community boards. However, reading through his comments, satisfaction, um, he actually wanted to get rid of the entire community board and the entire council. I'm not quite sure how that would work. Um, I'd like to think of myself as a person who weighs up the options and I did look at the proposal but I can't see enough detail there for me to actually say that what has been proposed is a better or even equal to the community boards as they operate. Are the community boards perfect? And I'm sorry if I will go a little bit over time. Um, no, they're not perfect. You know, there's personalities there. People have their quirks. They have their pet things that they want to work on. The same could be said of the council. And sorry, there is potentially council is the same as well. But because we're humans, okay, we have our little things we like to work on. I think the community board could be more proactive at getting out there. It could be more diverse. We need to um, actually go out to the community. I think the meetings are very formal, which put people off. Okay. There are many things we could do, okay, but the system is not broken. We don't need to completely replace it, and I think we should be looking at whether we can improve what we have rather than getting rid of it. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's my closing line there. Thank you very much. Right. Have any um, questions? Councillor Good. Kia ora, Cam. Um, Kia ora, James. Thanks for coming along, and um, good to see you playing a part in democracy and, and uh, presenting today. Uh, we've already heard from a number of submitters, and, and one thing that's been interesting, um, I've got four questions. The first yep. one is, oh, one thing that's been interesting is the um, uh, the kōrero from Holly, from, <coughs> excuse me, the Paikakariki Community Board, mm. where it's no secret that they punch well above, above their weight and yep. achieve quite a lot in um, their community under the current structure, with mm. the current resources and the current powers. So what do you think makes it different for Paikakariki to be able to achieve that yet when all the other community boards are asking for more powers, more responsibility, more resources and so forth? And then I'll come to my next question. Okay. Um, so part of that comes down to um, the community, also comes down to the people that are on the community board. Um, they may, you know, everyone has their...
like I said, their pet projects and what they want to push and what they want to do. Those projects that the Paikokariki board wanted to do may have resonated with the community and they get more, get more done. There's certainly been plenty done by the Otaki Community Board in the past and there's still potential for more to be done. Thank you, because I guess all we are looking at as a council is how we can improve our representation and delivery to the community. So it goes to my next question, which you've sort of touched on a little bit around the issues within community boards. And I say community boards because it's not just one. Um, there has been some comment about the responsibility on council to resolve that. What do you think, based on your, um, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, and more so being courteous to you in terms of limited knowledge, or maybe more so of what those issues may be, what do you see as a pathway to improving the performance of community boards um, that will be retained? Yep. There certainly has been personality clashes, um, and some of you, without naming names, I know there are people within the community board structures that have been a bit painful to the council, um, and they may have got onto the community boards due to their, um, like I say, pet project and something they won't want to push. Um, Certainly that comes back a little bit to the chairs in terms of how they deal with the people on there. Um, and I think there's an opportunity there for the council to provide the training there to assist the, the chairs with control of the community boards and making them a, a better team. Um, we've certainly, um, one of the things with community boards is that those are the people coming in at the base of the council, at the base of democracy, so they're less likely to be exposed to troublesome people to the way things work and to have had the training and people skills and maybe even the political nous to actually how to deal with um, troublesome people or troublesome subjects. Um, but as many of you around this table have been um, community board members in the past, um, I can even see from my short experience that it does give a really good grounding in how the council works, how the community works and what's out there and what's happening. I mean, my eyes have certainly been opened even in the short time that I've been on the community board as to how things work. Thanks, Cam. The other bit I want to sort of segue into is in, in all of your corridor this morning and all three hats that you wear <laughs> with your shirt on, yeah. um, there's been no discussion <laughs> around the purpose or importance of councillors, be it ward councillors or district-wide councillors. You've um, referred to access to the community board. Mm -hmm. um, and to follow on from that, and I asked the same question of both Shelley and Chris when they presented as members of the board, I left this to you now yep. because you're speaking in your capacity more so as Cam Butler, um, as a member of the community board and a co-signee to the group submission around essentially what is the status quo, yep. how did the board come to that position when two of your members have a preferred position of no ward councillors? And what do you see as the right, do you... Because that was a consensus of the, of the four. We talked about it, we met, we chatted, and while Chris, Chris had a particular um, requirement or a idea of having no ward councillors, I still see the value of having the ward councillors. Um, and so we chatted that through and that was the, the middle ground. And so then what do you see is the role of, uh, uh, of council, let's just to say councillors, yep. with the retention of community boards? Because again, all your discussion to this morning mm -hmm. has been around access to the community boards, funding to the community boards. Yep. I didn't really see a role there for councillors. <laughs> Don't worry, James. I'm I'm not trying to um, say that you you're not important and that you, <laughs> <laughs> and that you, that you should that you shouldn't be left out. <laughs> I, I think we should move along. <laughs> yeah. Um, from my point of view, the ward councils are still there because they are an important asset to the community because they come to these council meetings here and they have the vote and they put the um, voice forward so they're an integral part of the democracy machine. Um, the community board gives another avenue for people to talk to and means that the, some of the smaller items and things that maybe aren't quite so important can get dealt with by the community Uncle board. Kia ora, just a quick question Cam, you mentioned yeah, the importance of diversity on the boards and mm -hmm. also people feeding into the conversations that happens at that level. What are some ways that you feel we could encourage and support that diversity of people actually standing for community boards? Yeah. Uh, million dollar question. Um, so I know when I was looking at standing there were people trying to get a member of the local iwi to stand and to be honest if I knew they stand would wanted to stand I would have actually withdrawn my, my mm -hmm. um, application. Um, I think there should be more diversity on the board and 
sometimes in Otaki we do struggle to get the iwi on board, whether that needs to be an assigned position or whether the board itself needs to be far more proactive at going out to them and talking to them to get either their ideas or to have someone at the at the table to bring more diversity to the to the board. Right, um, Mr. Butler. No other questions. Thank you for the time that you've taken to engage with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Have a good day. Right. Um, the next submit is Mary Allham. How are you? Welcome. You have um, three minutes and then question time. Um, Morena, Mayor Guru and councillors, can you hear me through yes, this? Yes, we can hear you through Okay. Um, do you have a copy of my response in front of you? You do. So there's, is there any need for me to go through that item? No. Mm. Great. Okay. So really, I'm here just to summarise and you may think because I'm one of those people or maybe the only person who has said I believe in the abolishment of community boards that I don't believe in robust democracy. I do indeed believe in robust democracy and I think, uh, Councillor Sophie, before you I was the youngest New councillor in New Zealand to be elected in 1968. So. Um, I've been interested in, in my communities for a long time. Um, my reason for the abolishment of community boards is that I believe that they don't have the power or the authority um, to actually get anything done in a real way. Um, they really only have power to recommend and no real power at the council table. But I do feel that if we do abolish community boards, we should then increase our ward representation because ward councillors do have full voting rights and they will be more effective in representing each ward and the community as a whole that they represent. Um, the five disparate communities in Kapiti in the past have been called the string of pearls and the ribbon development along the coast. These are not cultured pearls, perfectly round, same colour, <laughs> sitting next to the next one. They're natural pearls, each with its own shape, colour and character. And this identity will not be preserved and cherished by amalgamating one community with another. And for example, Waikanae with Paraparamu. They're each very disparate, communities with their own identities and they need robust ward councillors to protect and enhance this as growth and de development occur. And I believe that Paraparamu is um, destined to be the city and the, the centre of most commercial and most growth. And, and I applaud that. But I think that Waikanae, for instance, has very much a a village atmosphere, and I think that that should be preserved. A number of councillors, if we need more than 10 to adequately represent each ward, then so be it. As by discarding one level of democratic representation, we need to ensure we have sufficient ward vitality across the district. So that's really my case. Are there any questions? Um, Councillor Hanford? Yeah, thank you, Mary. <laughs> and I would love to connect at some point as well outside of this just to, to talk about your experience too because that's awesome that we share that, share that experience. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, you're not the only one also that agrees okay. or that's, that's brought that point to us. So thank you for, for kind of though sticking up and saying that's what you think is best for representation in Kapiti. It, yeah, it's, it's awesome um, to, hear, to hear your perspective on it. But... We have had people who have come in and said that if community boards don't have the power at the table to you know, vote or to, to, to kind of have that say in decision making, then we should give them that power instead of kind of getting abolishing them and, and thinking about another way to do it. So what makes you think that ward, better ward representation would kind of have, yeah, have, have a good impact on our representation in Kawhiti and in better 
My experience with wards, and I was part of um, Hutt City Council in the 1990 amalgamation that the uh, just in the commission, the local the commission um, insisted, and we brought in um, Petoni, Wainui Omata, and Eastern Bays, kicking and screaming. They didn't want to be with us, and we quite frankly knew that. Um, and they felt they felt in that case that they just didn't have power or authority, and they would be taken over by the whole mass, and their individuality would be lost. And I think community board members become disheartened because they don't actually have that authority. And if you gave them that level of authority, it would be a bit messy because how, how, would, you, how would you actually um, get the numbers onto council chambers to vote from community board levels? Whereas if you have a ward representative, or more than one, for the larger wards, there should be, I believe. Um, they they have the authority. They're passionately interested in what they're doing, and they're part of a team, which is a a, hand, a number that can be handled. So I'm not I'm not at all worried about increasing the number. I mean, there's the point at which it becomes inefficient. But how would you how would you get all the how would you get all the board, the community boards onto the council table? So. Mary, can I ask you a question? Um, the power you're talking about is in terms of the voting power around the council table. Am I right? Yes. What about the power of influencing decision makers? Um, when Jenny Rowan was elected mayor, one of the first things she did was to allow the community board chairs to sit around this council table. What that allowed them to do was directly, they have speaking rights, but no voting rights. That allowed them to influence decision makers. That you would accept the fact that that's a form of power, and you can use it effectively, with, and I've seen that being used effectively. Let me give you a particular example. In Pakakariki, the people wanted to preserve the, the local hall they were able to convince council, which council has the sole right of rating, to introduce a local rate. So therefore, you see, even in terms of budgeting and expenditure, they were able to influence it. And today, that hall is a tremendous community asset. Yeah. Your response, please. If I could answer that, Mayor Guru, that totally re relies on the ability of the community board representatives to influence and it, when it comes down to it they still don't have a vote and it's a vote that counts. Paikokoreke have some exceptional people, all of our wards have some exceptional people but they still are only there to recommend and to, and to influence but they still don't have a vote and in the end it's a vote that counts. Let, let me um, introduce another layer to that. Everybody around the table has one vote, including the mayor. Therefore, it depends on the people around the table to influence others. So therefore, the aspect of you being able to influence is the key factor. Even by your account, you only have one vote. So it's the, your ability to influence others is a key political negotiation that you need to have to achieve outcomes. Um, having said that, um, I, you can respond to that or we can go on to the next person. Can I respond to that? Please. Um, I, I think um, councillors become quite tough and quite good at what they do with practice. And it's, it's a competitive table because you are all trying your best to get the best for your community. Your community boards at that level is not quite as robust, not quite as tough, and I don't think the people at community board level actually have the clout that the council table has. 
Thank you. Um, Councillor Good. Morena, um, Mary, your experience and wisdom is coming through in your answers. So I just, I really appreciate you coming in and appreciate you submitting. We're, we've come under a lot of criticism for the proposal we've put out there. And the previous speaker said, you know, they'd looked around and other councils had 10 submissions. We had 531. And I think this table's view on that is the testament of having a robust discussion and actually being brave enough to explore that. So I just wanted to, um, I do have a question for you, but I wanted to thank you for um, having an alternative view, challenging the status quo. The questions that I have is around um, your comment about removal of community boards because they lack the authority and power. We've had a number of written submissions and, ver and, and speakers say that if we gave the boards that authority and power, that solves the problem. So I think you've actually partly answered this, but I, I had my light on, so I need to answer you the question. What are you, what, what's your view on that? This uh, answer to the problem is simply giving them the authority and power. Well, I think I have partly answered the question. How would you give the community boards the power? Would you have one representative, the chair of the board, who would come along and have a voting right at council tables? Is, is that how you would do that? And if you would, do you not think that your ward councillors are sufficiently in touch with, at grassroots level with their community to represent them wholly. Um, I mean, it's, this is the issue, isn't it, really? Absolutely. And I believe your ward councillors are. I think if they're, if they're passionate enough to want to represent their ward and they can do it because there's enough of them, then I think that is adequate. Thank you. I have two more questions. Um, one is further on the community board. So we have had a, a, an overwhelming number of submissions in support of retention of the community boards. The council is open-minded in terms of the process. If there is a decision to retain community boards, what do you see as their role? If communi community community boards do come on to council, no, if they are retained, what do you see their role being? Well, I think their, their role is, as I thought it always had been, to be more in touch with their community at grassroots level. They talk, they move among their community, they hear what people say, whereas many people in a community still think their councillors are out of reach. They're not, they shouldn't be, but that, that is what is perceived. And so if the community boards do continue, I think that that is the purpose for them. Thanks, Mary. The last one I heard was around um, discussion around ward councillors and district-wide councillors. You've made a number of comments, um, and again, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed your um, corridor this morning. Um, there's been little mention around the, the value or purpose of district-wide councillors. Now, I'm not suggesting they're not valued. I'm interested in your thoughts around the role that they play. Yes, I've been on two, two different councils. One was just district-wide, and the other one was wards and district wide. And um, my feeling is that ideally most ward councillors should think on a district wide basis. I mean, you're really forced to because the issues when you when you you have them before you at council table mostly are district wide, um, and so they're going to be very disappointed if they come in and, and realise that they're not just pushing for their own community. Um, so, I'm sorry, I've lost the... the no, no, I, I look, I, that's right, I like that. Yeah, but I, but I do also believe the amalgamating thing to me is very important. I spent 12 years that I loved living in Old Chucky. And in Old Chucky, we were at the end of the line, in the northern end of the line, and we had to fight a small group of us, including Adamil McLaren, who had the paper at the time, um, worked very hard to get things to happen for Old Chucky. And so I know what it's like living in a small community um, that has its own character, has its own needs, and it's right at the end of the boundary. So bigger is not better as far as I'm concerned. It's much more important to preserve the nature of the community. Thank you very much. Right, um, Councillor Holborough. Yeah, just very quickly, because I, I think we're getting to the end of this time slot. Thank you so much for coming. I'll talk about what the others have said about your wisdom and experience and how useful that is. One of the comments that we've had is that the ward councillor's workload would be far too onerous if we got rid of the community boards, that 
we need those numbers of elected members in order to really represent the views of the community. What would be your comment around that? Just, just get more ward councillors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that's what I meant when I said I, d I don't, I'm not worried about us increasing the number of councillors around the table. I mean, there is a limit, of course, to be efficient and effective and costly and all those sorts of things, but you need to have adequate representation for the size of the community. And if you have that, I don't believe that the workload is too onerous. I mean, they're there to represent their community. If they can't handle the work, well, they shouldn't be there. Actually, I have one more question. With the district-wide councillors, some of them are elected to represent not geographic communities of interest, but other kinds of communities of interest. For instance, Angela Buswell has, often represents the interests of the business community here alongside other business owners around the table. So I'm wondering, what are your thoughts around that in terms of district-wide versus ward? Yeah, so, the, so really what you're saying is here that if you've got district-wide people, you're more likely to get an overview from both business and commercial and, and other developments rather than concentrating on, the, on, on your own little community, but you're looking at the city as a whole. Yeah. And I think there is a need, if, if it can be handled with size for district-wide councillors, but there needn't be a huge number of them really. Thank you so much. Okay. Right, Mary, um, no other questions. Look, a fascinating exchange. Thank you very much for the time you've taken to engage with us. Thank you for allowing me to come and speak to you. Okay. Otaki rules. And good work. I'm always defending the work that councillors do. With lots, lots of things that I go to, they say, oh, the council this and the council that. They don't really understand how much you do do. So, you know, congratulations. Denise, um, are you ready to present your submission? Denise Halkater. Then i um, Denise, you there? Oh, I think. Then i Then um, welcome. Um, you've got, um, Denise, you've got six minutes. And then the buzzer will go, and we have got question time after that. Oh, tenaka, tenaka to ite ite kau ni he a kia koe kudu kau to ko nga nga manga nga nga kanohi o te kau ni he tenatata katoa. My name is Dennis Harpeter. I'm the current chairperson of Nga Hapu. Or take. And firstly, I, I just want to acknowledge my Tungane uh, cousin, Rupene Waka, uh, for the years he committed um, to our needs and our representation at Council. So today we have um, two comments to make one regarding the Otake Community Board. And Ngahapu Otaki supports the retention of the Otaki Community Board as an elected voice for our wider community to ensure that our local aspirations are advanced and our concerns are heard. It's from the point of contact to Council for um, local community groups and individuals, and Otaki Community Board has been an integral to the recent community and Ngahapu drive 
to support the implementation of the local alcohol policy in Otaki and to champion rangatahi-driven initiatives. Uh, in regards to the ward names, Ngahapu or Taki uh, do not agree to any proposal for a change of the name for the Otaki ward. The Otaki Papakainga established more than a hundred years ago through the allocation of lands to the active hapu leaders of those times still exist today. Though reduced in size, those papakainga still home some of the seventh and eighth generation whānau of the five hapu who comprise Gahapu or Taki. The removal of the name Otaki Ward from the Otaki locality seeks to deny our people of Otaki and Ngahapu or Otaki and all our future generations. It denies representation reflective of our unique identity and history. Uh, the name Otaki is derived from the deeds and utterances of Honui Ananaya, a descendant of Kupe who diversed these lands, stopping and naming places along this coastline. This important korero to kuiho, or historical information handed down to us, and the associated names have been retained and continue to be an important, enduring connection for our people to our tūpuna and these lands. Our whānau identify with the names and places, and we take pride in the history to the retelling of our stories. Waiata have been composed over the last one and a half centuries and continue to be sung by generations of today. The ongoing disconnect of Fano is an ever-present challenge to Ngahapu Wataki in being able to maintain the principles of our um, survival project Whakatupuranga Rua Mano and that our identifiable presence as mana whenua and our mana whenua vision for Otaki is based on our ko kaupapa tukuriho. Uh, we replacing the name with the board ward name downgrades the importance of the name of our historical town and would cause further disconnect for our people in these challenging times. It's been approximately 200 years since our hapu leaders and tūpuna arrived in Ōtaki. In 1840, they signed Te Tiriti o Waitangi in Ōtaki at Rangirupa, Ōtaki Beach. Despite the numerous challenges to our existence to our arrival, Ngāti Kapu Manawa Whiti, Ngāti Pare, Ngāti Mai Ōtaki, Ngāti Koroki e Ngāti Huia ki Katihuku, the five hapu of Ōtaki, who collectively form Ngāhapu Ōtaki, remain identifiable hapu. On behalf of Ngāhapu Ōtaki, I stand before you today, kānohi ki te kānohi, to remind you, Guru, as our Mayor and elected members, that Ōtaki is the name of our town and ward. Ngāhapu wish to reiterate our position and support to retain the name Ōtaki as our ward name and to retain the Ōtaki Community Board. Tēnā tātou katoa. Thank you, um, Denise. Can I start by asking you this question? When did you first um, know about the potential of the name being changed from Otaki War to the Maori term in terms of the Northern War? The, uh, at recent meeting things um, through our representatives at the time. So it would have been in our um, discussions with the long-term plan and other uh, meetings we have had with council uh, representatives and staff 
Thank you. Um, I've got a question here now from Councillor Pravanov. Through you, Mr Chair. Thank you very, very much for coming forward and, and speaking um, of your concerns um, in relation to um, retaining the Ōtaki Community Board and the name. So, um, and I certainly understand very much where you're coming from here, And I, but I just wanted to ask some questions uh, around um, the actual ward that has been proposed. So it actually extends down to Tihapua Road. And I'm just wondering um, how uh, the, the Ōtaki name would actually fit in that area as well. Um, it's, I have to admit it's a real shame that there hasn't been a really good conversation uh, about the names that have been proposed because um, I, can, I certainly understand what you're saying in terms of the township, but that ward extends much further south and I'm just wondering how it all, all fits in from your perspective. Oh, Look, sorry, I just missed your first name. It's Jocelyn Pavanoff. I'm the wife and I ward councillor. Oh, tēnā koe. Okay, so if I could describe to you Ngahapu o Ōtake, uh, a member kai hautu of our iwi Ngatiraukua. Ngatiraukua's tribal boundary extends down to Kukutauaki, which is further south of the Harpura Road. So our Ōtake township and the collective area Te Horo um, still sits within our iwi boundary and for uh, I guess the long term residents of Ōtaki and there's mana whenua, we acknowledge that we are talking about the township but it's been a long um, period of time that we have um, assumed that mana whenua and understanding and practice that our rohe ends south of Te Hapua Road. Thank you for that clarification. I, I think the line is somewhere around where the, the, the old sewerage ponds are in northern Waikanae Beach, aren't they? Yes, yeah, yes, thank you. Correct. Yes, so I appreciate your clarification um, in terms of that. Thank you. Councillor Coates. Morina, Denise, lovely to hear from you. James Coates, Ōtaki Ward Councillor here. Um, we've had previous submitters, or sorry, we've had previous um, speaker, Cam Butler from the Ōtaki Community Board, um, talk about the possibility of um, having iwi members on the Community Board. Um, and I just wondered your, your thoughts on that with having five hapu in the Ōtaki uh, rohi, how that would potentially uh, or could potentially work. I'm uh, interested in your thoughts on that. Tēnā uh, James. Uh, in terms of the community board, I, I guess we feel that we can be just as effective sitting outside of the community board um, and don't necessarily need to have a representative on the community board. Um, and, and speaking for how we can effect um, various um, new initiatives, um, support to our people um, as Ngahapu or Otaki, uh, there would be, I guess, some advantage to the Otaki Community Board in having a representative of Ngahapu on that Community Board potentially going forward, James, in terms of bringing um, corners of our community closer together and helping um, the wider area of our community um, get more familiar with Ngahapu or Otaki and our initiatives within the Hapore. Kia ora Denise, that's really helpful, thank you. Um, District Wide Councillor Jackie Elliott. Marina and Denise, um, thank you for your call all this morning. It's been really, really interesting. Um, and I take on board your, um, the thoughts of your, your hapu. Um, I wanted to ask you on place names of your opinion of the use of the, the old names Pahiko and uh, Taumanakau. 
because I really so, appreciate your, your thoughts, your, your views on those names. So I didn't quite capture the first one. I think the second one you said is Tomanuka. Mm-hmm. So Tomanuka is a is a Māori land name or the name given to a substantial block of land in Ōtaki by our tūpuna. Um, it, it's not a not all hapu were historically residential on all areas of that land, but in saying that most all of our hapu and our descendants have um, whakapapa, um, I guess, initiative uh, contact and um, connections to to those whenua. In, in terms of um, those names as town names, I think we, we connect them more with like Papakainga, our communal mm-hmm. living areas that really sustain us. And I think um, I think the Ōtaki name has just come more synonymous with the activities of our tūpuna in traversing and travelling to establish um, places and homes for their people over the years. Tomanuka remains an integral piece of land in Ōtaki, Whungahapu Ōtaki. Um, thank you, Denise Kapai. Um, the other name was for the South area, um, Pahiko. Pahiko. Pahiko, yeah. So Pahiko is the area just south of, um, within the vicinities of Ngāti Huia Ki Katehiku. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that name itself uh, lends itself to a lot of the activities that were undertaken by our people on the south side of Ōtaki River. I think if our people were keen to to change the name, I think we would have heard about that earlier. Again, I think the name Pahiko has a place in our history to be captured in other ways other than a, um, a change of town name. And I think the new road and the new highway coming through our lands has brought that to the focus um, in recent years. Thank you so much. That's really, really good to know. Thank you. De- Deputy Mayor Janet Holbrook. Morena, uh, for the korero this morning. Thank you so much for your input into this process. Um, so I, I just want to dig a bit more into this pl- into this place name versus a ward name. So I'm, I'm understanding how important Ōtaki is as a place name, but in terms of just encapsulating an area from where people are elected, um, how is that important in terms of its um, mana as a name? Uh, Janet, tēnā um, Janet, uh, uh, Described earlier in our um, in my um, in presentation and delivery to council today, we we talked about disconnect, and once a new name gets commonly used in all official documents and other areas, the smaller name of the of the township or the place has the risk of falling into an abyss, for want of a better description, um, because the most of the discussions and planning um, throughout the region, um, discussions potentially at local governments, regional government, will then look at the ward, especially when we are thinking about the three waters and water catchment. And so though that name, Kapiti Kitaraki, is probably going to potentially be a name more frequently used when talking about development going forward. I would hope it's not. I would hope it's not. But there is potential for people outside of Ōtaki who prefer the name Kapiti um, to be used to describe our rohe and our and the place we all reside. Um, our preference 
it remains that Otaki has a significant importance to us and to our people to remove the name collectively from our people, albeit in a local government polling environment, it still has the high potential to create a disconnect of our people. And that becomes a, a high and a, a big challenge for us to, to work, to mitigate, and to ensure that we can work to keep our whanau um, in the town where they prefer to live. That's the concern we have. Thank you for that. So, so if if that if if there was a a kind of commitment to retain the word or take it the name of the town and the name of developments and the name of everything else, just like in Porirua, there's a northern ward, but we still have Pukarua Bay, Plymouthton, all those places still hold their place names. Would that kind of alleviate your concerns a bit, or or is it just simply a no go for you, Janet? From our people here, my people in Otaki, at the moment it's a no-go. I would um, encourage further discussion at this level or with council representatives and with our wider hapu representative um, to ensure that perhaps the understanding can be improved amongst our people. If, if in another uh, few months' time out a few months' time, our people say that the concern is still as high now as it was when we met at the beginning of October, then it's likely to say that it will be a no-go. Thank you so much. It's, um, th thank you for bringing that concern and certainly um, food for thought and something to talk about. Thanks. Denise, um, there are no other questions, so thank you very much for taking the time to interface with us. Thank you. And the next is Lynn Sleep. Lynn, you've got um, you there? Lynn, you just need to unmute yourself and pop on your video if you would like us to see you. Lynn, can you hear us? Yeah, how's that? Lynn, uh, yes, we can hear you. You've got three minutes and then the buzzer will go. You've got uh, a couple of seconds to sum up and then you've got question time. Floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you. Morena, good morning. Yeah, interesting discussion. Um, I'm sorry I'm not wearing a mask. Firstly, about the proposed structure of the council, uh, you say that your proposal to retain the current split of ward and district councillors would be the best mix, but I couldn't find any evidence of this assertion or any analysis of the alternative. The public could be forgiven, therefore, for thinking that all you want to protect, all of you want to protect your current personal positions rather than making uncomfortable decisions. I believe that your distinction between district and ward is completely lost on the public. I can't accept that our current war councillors aren't familiar with or competent to speak about the whole district. Doesn't Councillor Hanford speak about the whole district on climate change, for example? Your report states that the public feel that councillors appear too remote from them. In my experience, it's the ward members that get out and about in the community. So the solution to the problem is clear to me. We need more councillors that connect the local community. You've provided some examples of other local authorities. Hasman District, in my view, provides the best parallel as a rural district with urban townships. They have 10 ward councillors. Make all the Kapiti councillors ward and you will create that connection to the community of interest that the public has requested. Two from the north, two from the south, six from the central ward make 10. And then hold ward meetings every six weeks to deliberate over grant requests and replace the community boards. The community boards are only a time waster that adds no value to the process. I have personally spent the past 15 years trying to get simple improvements for capital cyclists, but we still don't have 
any cycle lanes or low speed zones on some local street, principally because of input from uninformed local politicians. Community boards make sense where the communities feel isolated or remote. Going back to Tasman, my example there, the folks over the hill in Takaka clearly feel a little different to the rest of Tasman. But not here in Kapiti, where we are all well connected. No media. Right. Any questions? Councillor Hanson. Yeah, kia ora, kia ora Lynn. My question is, is kind of to hopefully get you to expand a little bit more too on the comments you've made around community boards and how you feel that the removal of them might actually help to move your concerns about, you know, safe cycling and, and increase cycling a little, a little quicker. So I'm keen to know in place of community boards, in your view, what might help to deliver some of those um, things that you think we need in terms of in terms of cycling quicker. Like, what are the things that you think council could do um, instead? If if you'd like to expand, that'll be great. Sure. Well, um, until very recently, we had two quite useful advisory groups: the road safety advisory group and the cycleways, walkways, and bridleways advisory group. The, the second one, the CWB, was a highly effective group with a very good representation. A lot of a lot of people who are active transport people and it did get things done. The road safety group tended to be uh, a place where people brought their concerns and the council officers tended to dismiss those concerns. Both of those groups are currently in recess. Members are feeling very miffed that it's not there. They, if they were if they were uh, resurrected, I believe there's, there's work being done at the moment on the terms of reference. If they were re resurrected, cyclists could, could come along. Uh, I, I encourage the, the two road, road cycling groups to come along to that road safety meeting about three years ago they just gave up because they weren't getting any any action. The mayor, the mayor's heard from them, so he knows exactly what, what I'm talking about. Uh, and the board meetings from councillors will be useful as well. I mean, I, I went to a, a Power Crown Committee board meeting a couple of weeks ago to ask for sharing a footpath, the, the new footpath that goes along Ramati Strait. Uh, it, it's a it's a matter which I believe could be handled by the by, by the staff. But I'm happy to go to a community board if it happens. But then it goes back and forth, and it takes it takes twelve months to get a decision. I, I went. My first experience with the community board was asking for bike corral at um, Marine Parade um, Power Pram Beach almost 15 years ago. The, the local cafe wanted that bike corral. He wanted to see cars away from the area where people wanted to dine outside. Uh, the council staff all said, yeah, that's a great idea. But we had to go to the community board. It took me six months to get the community board to agree. And it got only through, squeezed through on the casting vote of, of the, the chairperson the argument was that there are 200 um, car parks in that area. You're asking us to take one of them away. They, they found it very difficult to say yes, but the staff were all in favour. The staff knew that, that it's important to provide parking for cyclists. So the committee boards tend to be a, a, a filter and sometimes they take too long. So are you saying too then that those various advisory groups and potentially taking a look at what advisory groups we have and don't have could potentially be kind of one way of, of fulfilling the role that community boards currently are playing or should be playing? Is that, so for example, looking at, you know, what voices are represented by community boards and which ones aren't, and then thinking about how we fill that gap to also, you know, have those voices from our diverse community represented. So is, is that what you're saying too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, the road safety group it, 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 it has failed miserably. It, it, was, it was rebuilt about three or four years ago. And if you look at the terms of reference, they included people like high schools, they included all the three EWIs. They were all supposed mm. to be represented, but they didn't come along. And as a result, it, it just became a, a talk fest where, where, where people said, this is a problem here in our street. And, and the council staff said, no, we, we, we haven't got the funding, go to the long-term plan, dumbing is a problem. And, and, and we, it, it was ineffective. CWB works much better because it's chaired by the by community representatives. Councillors just sit there as members of the group. Mm, thanks for your thoughts, Lynn. That's really helpful. All right, Lynn, um, there are no other questions, so thank you for taking the time to engage with us. Oh, hold on, Councillor Provanov. Through you, Mr Chair, thank you, Lynn, for, um, for coming to speak today and your submission. So I just wanted to, um, you know, so I know uh, being a member of the Waikanae Community Board um, previous to myself becoming a councillor, I know that... Um, that you've had a lot of engagement with the Waikanae Community Board. And so I'm just, um, 
interested to to hear what you're saying, and, I, and I'm just interested to um, to ask how you feel that those um, communications or those um, activities could have gone better, or is it a case of where um, um, you wanted a different outcome from what actually happened? Yeah, thanks, Jocelyn. Uh, I mean, Waikanae has been difficult to deal with, and we understand it's a, it's a conservative community, represents older people, but um, we first asked for cycle lanes on Kimwara Road. Now, that's, that's the same sort of deal as we currently got on Kapiti Road. You have green paint on the side of the road for people who want to cycle actively in the traffic. Uh, but that was turned down. I went personally to another community board meeting about a, four or five years later, and I just asked for a review of a couple of junctions, um, uh, Narara Road and Park Avenue, where we were having difficulty getting cyclists to go through those junctions without being cut off by turning traffic. Now, this, this green marking is a, is a standard marking all around the whole country. You'll see it all around New Zealand, you'll see it overseas as well. It doesn't provide total safety, but it does, it does organise us. It organises us just as well as centre line markings prevent us from crossing the road you know, when we have all the lines. But the community board there didn't understand green paint. They didn't understand cycling. They didn't understand. They said to me, do you really think that will provide any protection? I said, well, it's a standard It's a standard that's used all around the country. Haven't you been to Napier, Palmerston North, Wellington? Why don't you understand it? They seem to want to have a different different set of traffic markings in Waikana because they thought they were different. Um, we, we're now facing the revocation, which will involve... Lynn, um, I, I think we've got your message. That town centre in Waikana will not have any cycle lanes despite the fact that we're spending a lot of money on it, it will not have any cycle lanes through the centre of Waikanae. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I think it would be good to have a, an offline conversation, Lynn, but I just wanted to make the comment too that it's great <clears throat> to hear from you, but ultimately it's council staff or council who actually provide the funds for these, you know, for this work. And so... Um, mm -hmm. It's actually difficult, you know, that the, the community boards can advocate on behalf of people, or, or but it's ultimately um, council officers who make those decisions about whether there's funds for the, and sometimes that can take a very, very long time. So, uh, Lynn, thank you very much for taking the time okay. to talk to us. And thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. All right. Uh, next is Nicolette Butler. Kilakoto Katoa. Hi, uh, Nicolette, you've got three minutes. The buzzer will go. Uh, you need to sum up, then you've got question time. The floor is yours. Namihi. Ko Nicolette Butler Raho. I'll take my submission as read and will expand on one aspect. That's the proposed removal of community boards. This proposal is inconsistent with the principle of ensuring fair and effective representation for individuals and community. I hold this view, but it's not just me who holds this view. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Remuneration Authority. They set the remuneration for community boards. It may be of interest to note that when they were looking through the representation arrangements for community boards across New Zealand, they noted that there were a range of different roles that community boards played. Some of them had significant significant delegations with significant budgets. Others played an advisory role. Regardless though, despite those variations, the Remuneration Authority concluded that the primary function of the overwhelming majority of community boards was representation and advocacy. And that is what the Council's proposal removes. Are you there? Because the very nature, yeah. because the very nature of what the community board offers is that representation, is that path into the council, it's that accessibility of having meetings at night, it's having people in the community to talk to, it's having the ability to vote for and be represented by members of the community, which makes the suggestion to replace community boards with appointed neighbourhood panels 
inconsistent with the principles which apply to your decisions today. Did you have any questions? Um, I just want to know, this is the first time I've heard this particular point, that community boards have their meetings at night. That's a good point. Um, Councillor Hanford. Yeah, thank you so much, Nicolette. I just have a question around that accessibility that you mentioned, because in some of my conversations with young people, especially, they, they feel like community boards aren't potentially as accessible just in terms of the formalities, and we've heard that from a couple of submitters too, that the, the kind of structure and formalities of, of the way that community boards work and meet could be changed to, or, or kind of um, altered slightly or enhanced to then increase representation of people who currently aren't represented, because although the structure might represent you, or might, you might feel like you're represented, there will be people who, um, who might be kind of on the fringes of our community who maybe don't feel so represented by the current structure of, of, yeah, of our arrangement. So what, do you, what would be your response to that and how you think we bring those people into the conversation as well? Um, kia ora. Thank you, Councillor, for the question. And I have understood it to mean that part of the desire to have some neighbourhood panels is to actually have a way to increase that diversity. Have I understood that correctly? I could not hear a response. Well, yeah, what I'm trying to get at is, is what you think would be the best way for us to increase representation of those people who are hard to reach. And obviously the panels is one, the, the kind of panel format is one way, but I'm, I'm interested to see if you have any other thoughts as well or on whether that would help. Sure, so I absolutely support an increased diversification of representation and that's not an issue solely in relation to community boards, it's definitely an issue for um, the council as a whole and it's something that I would really um, encourage greater focus on and that's participation at all levels, um, not just standing for council but also participation in voting and taking part in public submissions and consultation. So as I say, not just a community board issue, but far ranging. I would see additional approaches, such as engaging with iwi, engaging with youth, to be additional to that. And that, um, I must admit, I was, I've been listening to the debate um, and I had a bit of whakama or shame at some of the questions that were being put to, um, uh, to earlier speakers about how they saw their community and asking for information about boundaries and rohe in a way that made it seem like that the council hadn't really engaged with communities in considering what these proposals were. Sorry, I've sidetracked for a minute because um, I guess the key point is, yes, I completely support more diversity, but that should not take the place of, nor can it replace the importance of elected representatives in the community board space. Right, um, Councillor Coots. Kia ora, Nicolette. Thank you for your korero this morning. Um, I just want to pick up on a couple of points that you have um, commented on in your submission. Um, you sure. say that it is not in Ōtaki's best interest to reduce local representation through moving community boards. The point that I want to pick up on is or to have only one directly elected councillor. Would you mind just explaining further what you meant by that second part around only having one directly elected councillor? And then I have a follow-up question. Uh, councillor, may I know your follow-up um, question so that I can prepare oh, for it? Absolutely. Um, the follow-up question was in regards to the next point where you said you're frustrated that Māori wards have been delayed. And my comment regarding that was just, are you aware that that was at the request of our iwi partners? Mm. And we were simply respecting that request. Um, I do want to note, and I should have said it earlier, I hadn't raised any questions around the community boards because I think we've received significant feedback uh, in response to that. And what I'm interested in is some of the feedback around um, councillors, ward councillors, district-wide councillors, hence the question. Kia ora. Thank you, councillor. It actually related to the earlier question about whether there should be five ward councillors and five district-wide councillors. Um, I, uh, as expressed in my submission, uh, I think that there's, it's, there's an importance of having ward-based roles to provide a range of views. 
um, and that together councillors from those wards should work to make decisions and provide a whole of carpet view. Um, on the second point in relation to iwi representation, I think from what we've heard today, um, there is room for improvement in how the council engages with iwi and and um, and uh, iwi partners, and so I completely encourage the conversations to keep on going. It is not just a once-off conversation about an issue. It's a question on what more is needed to bring about the introduction of Māori wards, not just whether the time is right now. It's about what resources can be used to encourage that, to support and uh, the diversification and the representation that is missing from this table based on some of the questions I've heard today. Done. Sure. Thank you for that response, and I, I would respectfully say I think that we're doing that. Um, uh, the um, the follow-up question that I want to have based on your response was there has been a number of submissions supporting no district-wide councillors or fewer district-wide councillors and more ward councillors. So based on your responses, is that something that you support in terms of smaller wards and more ward councillors? Uh, councillor, I wasn't raising the issue of small awards. I was raising the issue of ward representation. I do uh, believe that ward representation uh, makes it easier for the elected member to put forward views at a, um, at a council-wide level. There is always an ongoing tension, whether a local park is a local park, it's a regional park, how that, what it means, um, with how it, an Otaki decision, how that impacts on the whole of the region um, or the district. Um, but I support ward-based councillors. I'm not proposing, um, sorry, you'd mentioned smaller wards. That's not part of my submission. Um, just as a follow-up comment as well, councillor, um, you made a point about what the council is doing. In increasing um, and improving pronunciation of Tureo would be a great place to start. And I'd be really interested and we'll be continuing the corridor on how the council is acting as a uh, and respecting the um, treaty relationship and the importance of iwi in our community. Kia ora Nicolette. Councillor Holborough. Kia ora Nicolette, we certainly uh, do respect Te Tiriti or Waitangi and uh, I think it's a bit, um, maybe a little bit dangerous to make presumptions based on a couple of questions by councillors at one meeting in terms of the hard work that our staff do and in the iwi space. In. But having said that, um, you made a comment that we are not meeting our obligations in terms of fair and equal representation. So that, that's a strong word, obligation. And you said that, that's, that, that we can't meet those obligations without having community boards. There are 27 councils around the country that don't have community boards, including our neighbours, Porirua. And I'm just wondering, what are your comments? Are they not meeting their obligations? And um, should we be complaining to the Electoral Commission about those councils? Uh, Councillor, I think if you look at my submission and the words that are used, I'm referring to the principles of the Local Electoral Act. And they refer to the principles that you are required, obliged, that the Act is designed to implement, is to ensure fair and effective representation for individuals and communities. And you'll note that my submission relates to your proposal to remove community boards and replace them with appointed neighbourhood panels. From that proposal, I say that is inconsistent with your obligations when you are making decisions as elected members under the Local Electoral Act in relation to this representation review. So if it assists, it relates to the principles in Section 4 of that Act and how you abide by those principles when you are making the decisions you're obliged to make in relation to the representation review. Um, also, um, the comment about the submissions, uh, that's why I paraphrased it, saying, based on what I've heard today. So, look, I'm really happy to keep uh, up the conversation. I know that Councillor Coots is really useful at engaging and really good at engaging with the community on Facebook and things like that, and I've appreciated his responses. So, always happy to keep up a conversation, and that's why I framed it based on what I'd heard while waiting today. Kia ora, Nicolette. Right, uh, Nicolette, uh, there doesn't seem to be any more questions, so thank you for taking the time to engage with us. 
Kira. Um, right. Mas on. She's going to step in. Mm, where, where the others? Oh, they're having a quick. <laughs> they're having a sugar hit. You can go now if you want, James. Dollar stop. Where is she? Tena Kwe Jin, you got um, three minutes, the buzzer will go, you need to sum up, then it's question time. Okay, um, sorry I didn't realise I could do it by Zoom, but my Zoom person's away, so I had to... Not, not a problem. Um, representation is really important, and I've lived here for almost 50 years, and I've worked for the original Kapiti Borough Council and I lived through the amalgamation and it does have challenges. We've got these little settlements um, and each of them has got a different nature and it's really hard. We ha I think we have to work even harder to bring and make a, a community of interest when we've got lots of little things. I know other places have it as well. Um, each sector deserves representation. Um, community boards are the grassroots representation at the moment. Um, and my experience has been that community boards are a really good place at identifying specific problems for their um, communities, but they can sort of get stuck at the council table. Um, and I believe one of the ways to maintain the democratic process where we have elected people from our community is to give the chairs not only speaking rights, but voting rights. Um, somehow, we have to make sure that the councillors, per se, really hear the concerns that are being brought forward by the community board chairs to the council. Um, I may be wrong, but I think one of the examples is the Waikanae people wanted to keep their green waste and it came here as they as that's what they from the community board I could be wrong and then council said no we can't do that. And against a mandate or a or a willingness to be a, a climate you know changing sort of council acknowledging that we want to reduce vehicle use, etc., etc. it just sometimes is topsy-turvy. So I see one of the problems is that community talks to community board, community board says, yeah, great idea, takes it to council, and it gets stuck. So have I got a moment more? Yeah, you can sum up. Oh, so we need to give community boards more power. We need to give... Um, May, maybe a wider mandate. We certainly don't, I certainly don't want to see them replaced by um, appointed people. That is not democracy. That is death to democracy. We need to find what are the really good things in community boards, help community boards work really well. Thank you. Right. Um, questions, uh, Councillor Coates. Kia ora, Jane. Good to um, see you again. Um, Wataki Ward Councillor yes. James Coates. Um, you're not the only one that has um, talked about 
um, particularly giving community boards voting power or the chairs. So I just want to tease that out a little bit, um, as I have done with other submitters. Um, what first question is, are you aware of, um, so, so our council allows community board members to have a seat at the table, many other councillors, Wellington for example, don't. Um, are you aware of any other councils that allow voting rights for community board members? And then I have a follow-up to that. No, I'm not, because um, cause I found that there wasn't... Oh, it doesn't matter. No, I'm not, but we could be world leaders. So uh, the follow-up to that then is, how do you see that works? And as a fellow community board, as a previous, sorry, community board chair and deputy chair and community board member, how would a, a community board, assuming that it's a chair, it, it might be another representative at the table, be able to carry that vote without the, um, I guess, the um, consensus or discussion of their fellow members? Because sometimes there isn't the time to even have that discussion if there's a, a notice of motion on the table or a, a change of um, uh, uh, motion, complete change. How do you see that working out in, in practicality? A very good question, but I put it forward. I put my idea forward of the council of the community board having a vote as a way of giving them some more power. Because at the moment, things often get stalled. So that was just the thought. And as you've just said, you have a discussion around the community uh, table and the original idea gets changed from a pink balls to black balls or whatever it is, and it works. And so, yeah, it does, yeah. It does create a problem because if the motion gets changed in that discussion, the person who has got the vote has got to change. The last bit I want to tease out about that is you've referred to the community boards being the grassroots of the community. Now, I don't disagree. I think um, they, they do have a, an important role to play there. A lot of people have quoted Mike Reid in terms of the value that he puts around community boards, but he does say that they're not little councils and they need to see themselves as part of the community and not part of the government in terms of... So then again, how does that... How do you see that changes things when suddenly they become a decision maker? They become the person that has the vote as opposed to someone that represents the... Because we're genuinely interested in trying to get a, a democratic uh, representation that is effective. OK, I'll answer ask a question of you. Was I right about the green waste matter? Did the, did the Waikanae board say we want green matter, waste matter to stay in Waikanae? Yes, I did, but I guess... Okay, no, that's, that's my question. Sure. Um, now I've lost my train of thought. Um, I think somehow, if, if my presentation just results in you good people going back and scratching your heads and saying how can we how can we make community decisions because that's basically what a community board decision is come up and get approval um, that's that's what we need we need to try and um, we need to work vigorously to make sure that community boards don't feel disempowered it must be very frustrating for community boards chairs to come back from the meeting and say, council threw it out. They didn't want to know about it. Mm. You know, so, I understand. Um, so last question, just based on the discussion that we've had. Councillors um, uh, absorb in a massive amount of information through reports, through briefings, through meetings and workshops often not attended by community board members. The invitation's there but not attended. So how do you see that community board members are then in the position to make those decisions at a community level when they're not uh, necessarily receiving the same level of information? Well, I think community boards, the, the things that they can say yes and no about, things like um, cycle racks, things like taking out one parking lane uh, session down in the I heard Lynn Sleeth's one and we've been asking for the same thing down in Paikakariki and it actually came through 
from a staff member who said this is what we're going to do because it's the first one when you come into Paikukariki, which is actually a very safe, unsafe place to have cars backing out of because people come down the hill rushing to get across the railway line and into Paikukariki and it's very dangerous. I would never park there. So it needs to be used for parking. So sometimes there's a disconnect between who... Um, we as ordinary members of community and what things done go to, whether it's community board, because the community board then takes it to the council, etc., etc. Sometimes it just doesn't quite work. But I'm saying keep some form of community representation. I don't see a ward councillor being able to do it all. Sophie probably doesn't sleep very much now, but she would never be able to sleep. <laughs> um, because it's true, if you've got two people, you actually have three, you know, the work of three people gets done. Um, so if you've got four ward uh, community board people part-time, that's at least the work of sort of six people sort of thing. You know what I'm saying? It, it, there's got to be some work done, but do not put appointed people in because you've got to make councils be more, f uh, communities be more friendly towards council. If you went and appointed people for your, um, you know, with with the antagonism there is in the council about the the gateway project, if you went and said we're dis we are doing away with community boards and we're appointing people, I think a World War Three would start. Um, so I'm saying community boards are seen as a safe place, part of council by many people, a safe place to raise issues. It's really scary for people to come and stand up here and say, hey, councillors, um, this is what I want, sort of thing. And it's not what your job is. It should be filtered through somewhere. So community boards in whatever sort need to be democratically elected people, but they need to have a few more teeth. Councillor mm -hmm. Hanford. Yeah, kia ora Jan, I just have a quick question. You talked about how community boards are a really good place and space uh, and also a really safe place and space for most people um, to raise concerns or ideas that they might have. But also we have to acknowledge that not for everyone and there will be parts of our communities who, which are you know, currently kind of disconnected or disengaged with the current kind of structures or, or model of representation that we have. How do you think we kind of reconcile that and make sure that, you know, if, if the current kind of model is, is maintained, that those people are then actually brought in and they feel like it's a safe place. Because for you and someone who's very experienced with speaking and very articulate, it's a safe space for you. Um, but for some of my peers, you know, it's not, they don't feel the same and they feel very intimidated even speaking at a community board level. So how do we, how do we reconcile that too? Yeah, it's a problem. And one of the things that you've done, Sophie, in our areas is great because we now have karakira, etc. So it's much more culturally um, diverse, and I really appreciate that. Um, I think it's up to the people like myself as a community person is to actually affy those people and support them and bring them along. We as a community need to do that. And I, I've brought a number of young people along to speak about various issues. Um, but I wouldn't bring young people here because that's too intimidating. And often getting the flax bushes removed from alongside, and they still haven't been, by the way, um, alongside the track because the flax bushes have been leapt out and grabbed the guy's bike um, and he came in with his broken shoulder. Um, I stood alongside that kid and talked with him and we wrote down what he was going to say and uh, he stood up and did it really well. And council has lost the ball or dropped the ball on getting it done. So that's the problem. We take things to community boards and then they sometimes get lost, but I believe they would get even more lost with appointed people. Right. Uh, moving along, Councillor Holborough. Jan, um, th thank you for your input and thank you for your ongoing input into the community board as well which is really valuable and you've achieved so much through that interaction and so I can understand and, and your, your desire to keep community boards. In terms of appointed, appointed panels, I mean I don't think that's specifically referred to 
you know, we, we talk about neighbourhood panels, but it's unclear how they would be selected in the consultation document. But that aside, are you aware that up to half of community board members can be appointed anyway? So Under the legislation, mm. community board members can be appointed as it stands. We just choose to have them elected. So it's a feature of community boards to have appointed members, and we in fact have had appointed members when we've had a resignation within a year of elections. Do you have a problem with that in terms of community boards? And just because they could be appointed, um, th th that's a useful, useful thing to have in your back pocket. And just like um, Judith Aitken, I mean, you look around the community and you go, yeah, that person. You yeah. still have to shoulder tap them. Um, I think that having a democratic election is where we should start. And that should just be used for those sort of situations. Yeah, so we also have a community board that was elected unopposed, and we've had that in the past in Paikakariki as well. How do you think that fits in with the idea of elected representation? Um, it's still those people can stand right? so they still have to make that decision to put themselves forward whereas if council appointed people it's from the top down as I, I don't think that's been suggested by the way, it just says community panels. It doesn't say council appointed or anything like that in the consultation document. So just, just clarifying that. Yeah, it's. I think a number of people I've talked to have sort of read it that way. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that might be a misreading of the, of the suggestion. Um, but I just, I'm just going to leave that, that aside for one moment. In terms of giving community boards more responsibilities, You've said that um, Councillor Hanford doesn't sleep much, and I'm sure you're right about that with the amount that she does, but the chair of our community board, Holly Ewans, doesn't get a lot of sleep either. I mean, if, if the community boards had more responsibilities, how would, that, how would that be possible for them, particularly with the remuneration set as the way it is at the moment? Yeah, they, they do a huge amount of work for um, peanuts, luckily. We haven't got monkeys. We've got intelligent people. <laughs> um, when I say give them more responsibility, it's somehow give make sure that they are heard at the council table, and more of the the more of the community needs can can um, come through. My my sort of question is, if I wanted. Uh, painted yellow lines like the no parking lines on Ocean Road because the bus couldn't get down and the fire engine couldn't get it down. Um, I took it to the community board. The community board said, damn fine idea. They talked to the road safety road engineer who was there and it was done, basically. Great outcome. It didn't have to come to a council. So this is what I'm wondering. There are some things that community boards can easily do. Does it get mixed up somewhere? Um, I wanted to get a, a, a cycling sign at either side on the Wellington crest. And it's, uh, it was in things for bring up, and then it fell off that, and I put it back on again. So sometimes things get done. And sometimes things don't get done, right, and look, that um, frustrates me. Uh, so that's I've, what I'm I've saying. I've got to get things moving. We are yeah, really that, falling well behind. Yeah, that. Well, I have waited for an hour, so thank you very much. And um, so there needs. That's where I think there's a there's a a hole that sometimes things fall into. We need to fix that hole. Yep, thank you for that, Dan. We'll take them away, please. Right. Look, I'm, I'm actually going on to the next. Sam Buchanan. Thank you, Jen, Jen Nisbet. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Sam Buchanan tōku ngoa. You're hearing me okay? Uh, Sam, we, it's a bit muffly, but you've got three minutes, and then buzzer will go sum up, and then you've got question time. Floor of yours. Uh, Kira, uh, you have my submission. I just want to stress the really two points. 
Uh, the basis of the submission is that we should massively increase the power of community boards and be that at the strength, uh, reducing potentially the strength of the council. And I did suggest that we could reduce council numbers and actually uh, better resource, better empower community boards. I suggested creating two new boards, one for rural areas and a second for uh, Raumati, splitting that, splitting the Raumati Paraparumu community boards into two and increasing the numbers to six, uh, six members for each board. Uh, the basic reason for doing this is that I think there is a crisis of democracy at, within the KCDC area. There's also that there's part of a much broader phenomenon, which is certainly happening at uh, all levels, but particularly at local government levels. Many of the suggestions I'm, I'm hearing that are at times critical of community boards are basically suggesting, well, we've tried democracy, it didn't work, so let's have a non-democratic solution, which is not what I'm uh, willing to entertain. Uh, I think that democracy can be made to work. There are obviously huge problems with it, but we should not be throwing out the process because it hasn't got the results we want. We should be seeking to improve the democratic process. I think many of the issues that have been raised about the capacity of community boards to do more will be addressed simply by giving them greater powers and greater uh, resources. And the willingness of the public to engage with community boards will be increased uh, reflective of those community boards' ability to get things done and to not see be seen as uh, sort of a minor player that often re comes up against the stumbling blocks of council, which has been alluded to by a number of people. So I think that's all I really want to say. I'm just happy to take any questions on that. Right. Any questions? Con Flanford. Thank you, Sam. When you say give community boards more power, can you just define kind of what you mean by power? Like, you're, you're saying beef that up, but if you could just kind of give us a bit more of a, yeah, an in-depth understanding of what that actually means to you, community boards having more power? Well, there's a number of ways that that could be done, and I think that um, some of that has to be worked out in practice, which is why I didn't go into a whole lot of detail in my submission. I mean, I said the suggestion that uh, chairs of community boards could have voting rights, rights at council, I think, is, is fine. And I think saying that, well, community boards don't have the knowledge is a great deal because community boards are often the holders of a lot of local knowledge. They may not have been to all the meetings and read the reports, although if they were better resourced, they could do that. But more importantly, they bring often years and years of experience within communities. They understand the capacities and the problems of the communities. And this is something I've had a trouble with at council level, is often councillors simply don't understand even things like the physical nature of a, uh, a space in a community and what can be done with it because they simply haven't been there for the last 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, so giving voting rights is one thing, but I would also say delegating powers from council to the community board. So decision making being made uh, at community board level when it pertains simply to local, local issues within the rohe of that community board would be another way of, and probably an improved way. I would also say increasing the funding of community boards and making funding to the community a primary task of community boards rather than being done at council level. Councillor Prabhana. Through you, Mr Chair. Thank you, um, Sam, for your submission and speaking today and waiting to, be, um, to, to have your turn. Um, I, I take it you heard the previous speaker and I had some questions for her and I will actually ask you um, the same the questions I was going to ask her. So um, so we've heard a lot about um, empowering community boards and the relationship between councillors and the community board and various disconnects. But I am just wondering whether you think there is potentially a disconnect between um, um, the operational side of council and community boards. And um, are you aware, for example, that um, the Greens um, Recycling um, Centre, the community board wanted to do some, um, some work around that, but was actually literally blocked to do that? Um, and on top of that too, that you will note here today that there are no community board chairs around the table and that is because they had been advised 
not to be here because they had put submissions um, forward by the community boards, whereas previously when they have done that, uh, they have sat around the table. So those are two examples of where community boards, they want to be enabled but have not been able to. So we, uh, would you like to make some comments about that, please? Well, that's a huge subject. In my experience on community boards, there was moments of good relationships with councillors and council staff, and there were moments of very poor relationships with uh, council and council staff. Some of that is a cultural problem. Uh, there's, I mean, I think quite broadly one could say that value and democracy is actually not particularly high on any people's agendas, and be they in the community, on the council staff, or, in the, or sitting in the council seats. Uh, and we, I found as a member of community board that it was actually very, very hard at times to uh, make something happen or make something not happen in many cases where we were trying to actually stop council processes that we found uh, problematic and unwanted and unnecessary from our perspective. Uh, it took quite a lot of work to influence those processes in any way, shape or form. But that's, that's a very huge question and a lot of it comes back to this issue of what is the council and the word council means many different things uh the council is the council that's sitting around the table you guys and it's also an institution that carries out certain works and it's also something even broader than that which is uh, uh, uh the representation of a community of commu a number of different communities which are all very different and have very different aims and uh and uh desires as to how they want to live now that is a cultural problem in many cases that uh, a person who lives in Waikanae or has certain cultural experiences may not understand the culture of Waikakariki and also the capacity of different communities which is so I'm, yeah I'm going all over the place here because it's an absolutely <laughs> huge question I would say the issue of defining governance versus operational activities is something that's really quite confused uh on one hand, we say there has to be a separation of governance and operational matters. On the other hand, we're asking councillors to be actually continually engaged with operational matters. So that is not a clear uh, situation. It's not, it's not clearly defined as to what the role of council in operational matters is. It's certainly not defined what the role of community board members in operational matters is. We are called in at times to... Uh, you know, I'm saying we as when I was on the community board, there were many occasions we were called on to comment and address operational matters. On the other hand, we're told, no, you're in governance, so you're not part of this. So, yeah, it's not a, it's not an easy question. It's it's very confused. It's a, I think it's a very confused situation. There's a lot of clarity that needs to be brought to how the democratic process works and what the roles of those people within the democratic processes are. And I would say at things like meetings and as has been alluded to by previous speakers that they can be intimidating they can block out other members of the community but there's a lot that can be done there i mean start with you need to rearrange your furniture if you want people to participate right um thank you, th um, thank you sam for the thesis yes <laughs> like um, no other questions um thank you sam for taking the time to engage with us okay thank you very much have a good meeting Thank you. Um, should we take a 10 minute break? We are 45 minutes late. The people waiting. What's your five minutes? Five minutes. Thank you to all our Zoom uh, participants who are waiting. Um, the elected members are just going to take a five minute break. We appreciate that you've been waiting, but we will be back um, in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. 